Lady apes, gentle apes, and modern apes of all ages, welcome back to another episode of Busting Creationists featuring debunking the seven myths of the Bible, Genesis, Noah's Flood, the full movie, <laughs> the feature-length presentation. Um, I am your your host, Erica. Uh, I also go by Guts at Gibbon on YouTube, which you should know because you're here. Um, I am eating some raw pasta because I actually have an affinity for it. I, I, I crunch on it quite a bit. Um, I just enjoy it. It's, it's a fun, a fun carbo-loaded snack. Um, and I also, of course, have my tea because, as usual, I recommend that any time we go in uh, delving into the muck and grime of, of the, uh, the Young Earth creationism uh, world of fancy, that you should have a, a nice drink and a cozy spot laid out. Um, Go ahead and do that if you haven't already. I, 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 highly, I highly recommend it. Um, and of course, before we begin, we're going to be looking at some cool... It's not anthropology today, regrettably, but we're going to be looking at some very cool uh, uh, science. And today it is uh, a mutualistic rela uh, relationship you can probably see from um, from this sort of, uh, whatchamacallit, a uh, tab. That's the one I'm looking for right here. Tarantulas and frogs team up. So Xenestis amonis is a tarantula, and it keeps pet frogs, which is really awesome. You can see in this cool picture right here, uh, here is uh, our, our, our beautiful older woman, and of course uh, her, her beautiful pet frog right here. And um, the interesting thing about this mutualistic relationship, other than that it exists at all, because it is quite interesting, uh, is that the tarantula, of course, protects the frog from, from predators or, or sort of interloping tarantulas that might seek to, to, to crunch him. Uh, and in turn, the frog keeps the tarantula's eggs clean of, of parasites and, and insects, which is a great deal for both of them. So we can see uh, this one calls them an odd couple, which is frankly adorable. Um, here, this one has a giant tarantulas keep tiny frogs as pets, insects will eat the burrowing tarantulas' eggs, so the spiders protect the frogs from predators, and in return, the frogs eat the insects. Um, you're probably wondering, how on earth could this evolve? And it's actually not nearly as complicated as it might seem. Essentially, uh, the tarantulas that, that tolerated the presence of frogs, who were of course drawn to tarantula dens because of the, the surplus of insects that were seeking to, to chow down on the tarantula eggs, um, had a higher rate of, of sort of uh, successful offspring, right, because less of, less of their eggs were being eaten or disturbed by insects thanks to the frog. Uh, the ones that didn't tolerate the frog's presence and ate them probably had a, a, a lower reproductive rate, uh, lower fitness overall, um, and thus slowly would, would die out until most tarantulas would, would be the kind that tolerate the, the presence of the frogs. Um, and that's how we get this cute little relationship. It really is just tolerance over time. Something quite similar happened with us and dogs, and uh, if you would like, you can check out my video on that, which is in maybe the description. I always forget to put them in the description. So anyways, we can go ahead and jump right in. That was just our little mini for today. Um, remember, be kind to your local spiders. Be kind to your local amphibians. Some of them are going to have a rough time with this whole climate change deal. So we got to be in it together, especially since we did this to them, <laughs> which is uh, disturbing. So uh, Zenestis Amonis and, of course, the little bitty frogs. So... If you remember from uh, last last time's ep episode, I, I'm going to say week. It, it wasn't actually a week ago that I did that recording um, in reality, but you were experiencing it that way. So that's good enough. We discussed the, the, the previous myth, which talked about, uh, I don't know, I think it was like the biblical account of creation being metaphorical. Um, the fact that I'm not an expert on this and I'm offering like half decent refutes should say a lot about how how theologically sound it is. Um, <laughs> that is to say, not very. So we're gonna start here uh, with their shilling. I've got my shilling kazoo ready. Um, last time I did like a little made up tune and I didn't think it sounded very good. So we're gonna go back to the little Yoshi's Island um, Mario Bros 
tune at the end once we get to the shilling again. But this is the previous episode's uh, sort of sort of shameless plug. Let's begin. Uh, hello? Just... Myth number three is Genesis 1 and 2 provide two different accounts of creation. At first blush, this may seem to be the case, but taking a careful look reveals something different. First, both of these chapters are inspired and historical. At least Jesus believed so when he quoted from both Genesis 1 and 2 in Matthew 19. At least Jesus said so, and you wouldn't want to go against Jesus, would you? Of course not. Um, that, that's, that's where they, they kind of try to rope in the moderates here. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning? I would hardly say that this is, uh, that this is quoting at least Genesis 1.27. This quote, made them male and female, uh, and said, For this reason man shall leave his father and mother, be joined with his wife, and she shall become one flesh. I'm not actually sure that Hebrew had like a connotation, uh, or rather Greek had like a connotation for quotes. I would imagine that it did. Um, so if this is indeed quoting, cool, that's awesome. Um, but I don't necessarily think that the first one is applicable, perhaps the second one, but even if so, uh, whether or not Genesis 1 and 2 and Genesis, the, the first half of Genesis in general is allegorical, really has no bearing on, on why Christ would repeat it, because the message is still true. That goes back to, to what I was saying about biblical inerrancy uh, and inerrancy literally versus inerrancy of message. I mean, I'm not even like sold on this kind of thing and I'm selling it better. Um, but that's what I do. I serve. Next, we need to understand how Genesis is laid out. While our Bibles today break Genesis into 50 chapters, the original text is actually broken into 11 sections called toldotes, which mean to bear or to generate in Hebrew. Genesis 1 provides the introduction, the overview of the creation of the entire universe in six days, which precedes the first toldote that begins in Genesis 2 verse 4. So you're telling me that, that, that the uh, creation accounts are split into separate toldotes. I didn't know what a toldote was. Want to see if that's legit? Goodbye, frog and tarantula teaming up. Toldotes. Toldots. Did you mean Toledo TS? <laughs> I wish that's what I meant. <laughs> um, okay. What is a toldote? It's a story or a genetic line... Translated generation. Story genetic line that came from generated to place your event. So, mm hmm. I don't know this for certain, so don't take this for, for, for gospel, gunch. But I feel like this is almost something that maybe happened at a point uh, in history, and uh, Genesis Apologetics is taking it as sort of the, the norm. As I said, creationists like to do that, they take the exception and make it the rule. Um, but, but maybe that's not the case. The occurrence of a system of ten told of divisions throughout the book of Genesis has long had the attention of Old Testament scholars. So this is, this is a paper from 1970. Not exactly the most up-to-date. But at least it's going to talk about the told dots. Or told dots. In the recent years, Professor Donald J. Wiseman... <laughs> Ironic, maybe not. Disagreeing with both the standard documentary hypothesis and oral tradition approach to the Pentateuch has developed the thesis of the Toldot in Genesis are evidence for the fact that the time of Moses' writing activities and written texts are already available in great abundance. So this all of a sudden makes quite a bit of sense, right? They're going with a, a hypothesis that was generated in 1970 um, to to bolster this idea that that these accounts are separate or, or sorry the same account even though even when we're using the toldotes and I feel like it should be toldot or toledot um, because we know how he pronounces words like vague for those of you who don't know he pronounces it vague um, which is just awful I don't know I don't know enough about toldotes to 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 comment on this. But at least we know that even using the toldotes, it, it doesn't really work. Let's let him continue. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 provides a complete overview of the six days of creation in a stepwise way. With each creation day starting out with God said, followed by his creative works on whoa, that whoa, day. Whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Pause, hold it. This is the exact Google image search image that I used in the last episode. And I didn't even see this. 
Look, it's even got Tan Adam and White Eve. That's pretty weird, you guys. Then concluded by there was evening and morning and a mention of the numerical day. Genesis 2 is not concerned with the steps of the overall creation account, but rather focuses on the events of day 6, including the creation of Adam, the gar Sorry. Garden of Eden, and its river systems. Adam's instructions for the garden, naming the animals, the creation of Eve, and the institution of marriage. Not this is a nice graphic here. I appreciate this graphic. I think this probably took a bit of time on part of... Uh, uh, Biddle and Company, Dan Biddle and Company, uh, but even so, obviously my argument is going to be that Genesis 1 and 2 are, are separate accounts um, by separate people um, for, for several reasons that we will get into. But that shouldn't take away from this nice graphic, even if I do disagree with it. I like also that he, he mentioned the river system. A lot of people skip that part because it's so boring. None of these details are in the first chapter of Genesis, they are saved for the second chapter that sets the stage for the third, which is the fall of man and the curse of sin, both of which happened in the garden. The second chapter also does not mention important creation events from the first chapter, such as the creation of earth, atmosphere, oceans, sea creatures, land, and the sun and stars, showing that it was not attempting to be a second account of creation. Mm. Sorry you can hear me crunching. I can't help it, I got pasta fever. And the only cure... There's more pasta. All right, Genesis 1, verse 1. We're going to have this pulled up because this seems smart. I trust Bible Hub. You guys trust Bible Hub? Ooh, ooh, no. I don't like this. I don't really like this. I want it to list many verses at the same time. We're Sorry. Again, there's nerding out going on in there. Okay. Can we not have more than one thingy showing at the same time? Maybe? Will this do it? Look at this. Tech genius. Okay, so. This is chapter one, and let's hop to chapter two. So. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Adam and Eve, boom, chapter two. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not sent rain to the earth and there was no one to work the ground. So this seems quite strange since plants were created on, um, on day, uh, what is it? I need the little baby image up. Days of creation. We'll use their, ver their version. I actually think it is quite, uh, cohesive. They're good with graphics. Oh my, did they steal it from Shutterstock? Look at this. Shame on you guys. Maybe they paid for it. Yeah, so day three we get plants. Uh, in the first, in Genesis 1, which was under my interpretation, the conventional academic interpretation we're assuming is the first creation account. And then in the second creation account, which was written by uh, the Yahwist source, um, I believe. I think the first one is Priestly, the second one is Yahwist, um, under the documentary hypothesis and uh, derivatives. We find that plants had not yet sprung up for the Lord God had not sent, not yet sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But then streams came and watered the whole surface. Then the Lord God watered the whole surface of earth. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So this is kind of weird too, right? Because they're created out of nothing in the first in the first version over here. Uh, hello, Bible Gateway. Yeah, down here. Mm hmm. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There's nothing about from the dust here, because dust, under the second source, is, at least in my opinion, and in the opinion of many of the experts, um, a clear reference to mortality. So that's two things so far that we have that are, are sort of discrepancies. 
when we're looking at these two cases. One is the fact that they differ in whether plants were there before or after man, and then the or whether when when they were in relation to man, and the other is uh, whether humans were created from nothing or from the dust. Let's continue. But at least they're admitting it. I mean, they're 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 doing it in a weird way, but they are admitting it. Now, I think I think it's important too to touch on this concept of um it's it's I don't know what they're called, but it's essentially a literary device. So it happens in the beginning over here in uh in the beginning. <laughs> it happens in the beginning of the Bible here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So this this is like a literary device that says, um, this is what I'm about to tell you happened, and here's how it happened. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here's how he did it. Um, now, interestingly enough, I didn't mention this in the previous video, but it says, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It's quite interesting that waters are already in existence, uh, as well as the earth. Even though it has no form, it's still present. So it's not like matter doesn't exist, um, which is just an interesting little tidbit. Um, and then again, this literary device, this opener happens here. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created and the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So this is saying, not when they were created, like once they had been created, or else that would have been the word they used. Um, this is the account of, the, this is another account. It's the account of the earth and the heavens when they were created, when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. This is that story. So we have two of the same story being told in a different way by two different sources. You might be wondering, well, how do we know why the Yahweh source is, is in Genesis 2 and Genesis 1 is the priestly source? And the answer is because they call God by a different name. One calls God Yahweh, the Yahweh source, and the other calls him Elohim, the Yahweh source, um, or the uh, priestly source, sorry. So priestly, Elohim, Yahweh, Yahweh. Um, it seems quite strange to switch back and forth if it's the same author. That's not very characteristic of any author I know of. But let's continue. These two chapters actually tie into each other, with each chapter providing important details not in the other. Some say that it appears that plants were created after people in Genesis 2, apparently conflicting with the Genesis 1 account that explains plants being made on day 3 and man on day 6. Genesis 2, 5 through 7 says, Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown. No, what they're going to say is that this is different from eating plants because no one was there to work the ground, but that's not the case because here in the NIV, what we have, and we'll look at another, we'll look at other versions in a moment, but they say, No shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. We're not talking about, about, like field plants here. I suppose you might be able to make that argument because it says uh, there was no one to work the ground. But then why bring the streams at all? Because humans don't have to toil and labor for their food until after the garden. So why bring the streams at all? Um, okay, let's check. Uh, they love the King James. Let's check that one. <laughs> yeah, here it is. It's their... Um, the, the the King James Version. This must be how Kent get, gets away with it, too. Let's check the Geneva one. That one's even older. This one says plant of the field and herb of the field as well. So, you guys know my... um. You guys know my uh, my um, sort of credo here. We gotta go older. Let's see what the original Hebrew says. Original Hebrew to English of Genesis. There's usually like a Strong's a Strong's concordance. Wait, let's try concordance Genesis maybe. Godrules.net. <laughs> mm. Hmm. That's not what I'm looking for. Is it me, Blue Letter Bible? Sorry, you guys are having me to witness me be like a ding dong here. I not know what I'm doing. When I should have done this previously. Instead of being a big idiot and doing it later. While people are watching. Maybe it's Bible Hub?
KGV plus Strongs. This isn't what I'm looking for, but maybe... Maybe? Ah, wait, go back. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay. Okay, these are the generations, plant of the field, herb of the field. Okay, so this one goes with that too. I feel like I've read a version where it where it doesn't. Um, but obviously I can't find it, so I'm not going to claim that... I'm not going to, like, use it from now on in the video if it's not there. I mean, I suppose I could, like... What I really should do is, is pause this entire deal. Unless it's Study Bible. It's not Study Bible, is it? Okay, so I did finally find it. I nailed it down, um, and I stand corrected because it does look like even when we're looking at our original Hebrew translation, um, the, the translation seems to be for plant of the field and herb of the field. So I'm not 100% sure why the NIV did change that, but I do recant my previous statement, kind of. And the reason I say kind of is because when you click on the, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it's hasadeh, kind of. Um, the, the word for of the field, we have a ton of uses of of the field early on, especially in Genesis, um, 130 something uses overall. Uh, but the more that you go down, we're still in the, in the field territory, the more you go down and the more you start to see things like of the country, out of the country, of the ground, um, things of this nature. So it's, it's not necessarily always meaning of the field. Um, but that being said, I think it's fair enough that this is the translation that they went with, uh, particularly given that it seems pretty consistent throughout the rest of, throughout the rest of the text. That does lead me to wonder, though, no, oh, this is the NIV version still here, so I guess we should probably switch to the King James, because I think that's what they, most of these guys use anyways, so we'll switch to the King James here, and we will read this together and see what we can't suss out. Okay, so read that part every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the lord god had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground um but but there went up from there but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground so considering we're talking about the whole face of the ground um and zero rain you one almost has to assume that even if the specific impact of this sentence isn't in reference to to all of the plants that they're still being impacted, unless all of them are hugging the rivers, um, because they're also relying on the mists in order to to water them. Um, but I do stand by the notion that these these two accounts differ both in in what they refer to God as uh, the creation of humanity, um, and and also this this weird notion of tilling the ground because humans didn't till the ground in the garden it wasn't until after they were punished um, but let's continue for the lord god had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground and the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground in this passage these verses call the plants plants of the field mm. and herbs of the field these terms are more specific than the grass herbs and trees described in day three well, hold on. The fact, I didn't actually go back and read 111. The fact that that has reference to herbs in general, also fruit trees, um, seeds, it, that, that I take back what I said. I think that it's entirely in reference to the same thing, or at least very likely. Oh, they busted themselves! three of Genesis 1, because none of these are accompanied with the of the field description. Hebrew scholar Mark Futado defines plants of the field as wild shrubs of the steppe or grassland, and herbs of the field as cultivated grain. Both make sense, especially given the context that describes there being no man to- Who do you know, Genesis apologetics, that is cultivating wild shrubs of the, shrubs of the steppes or grasslands in general? If herbs of the field is cultivated grains, grassland is just grassland. There's nothing else that you can grow that's going to look very similar to grass. 
So why are they digging themselves a hole like this? They could have just said, one is in reference to, to, to plants that we strictly farm and consume, agriculture revolution and the like. The other is not. It's all wild plants. But the fact that they're going further into this leads me to believe that, that, the, or that the academic consensus on this was probably strong enough that they felt it necessary to justify their position even further. Which leads me to believe, in turn, that these are the same kinds of plants, or at least very similar. You're, you're not going to get out of this grassland thing. If there were no grasslands, what do you even have? Trees? But it's weird because they also mention grasses in the previous, ver in the previous chapter. So I stand entirely by what I said. This doesn't jive with the, the days of creation. Day three is all of the plants. That seems to be what they themselves are suggesting here. Um, and then all of a sudden there's no plants again. Very strange. And herbs of the field as cultivated grain. Both make sense, especially given the context that describes there being no man to till the field and no rain yet. Then, in the very next chapter... But see, that's that's the interesting thing, though, because with, with the no tilling, that would make sense if it was that alone, but it's also no rain, which is like how most plants get their water. Um, so, so I'm glad they're bringing this up, though. We see it is these very herbs of the field that are cursed with thorns and thistles that add... Mm. and would have to till and farm by the sweat of his brow as a consequence of the fall. Indeed. But that only covers half the equation. Again, we're, we're looking at, at, what is it, the herbs and the, and the plants of the field? So again, that, that, that covers half the equation. What are they talking about here? Because of Adam's sin, he would no longer have it easy. Instead of eating from abundant fruit trees in the garden, he would need to till the ground, contend with thorns and thistles, and grow crops for food. The next contention that some people Whoa. bring up with the Genesis 2 account is that verse 19 states, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. It's that word formed which gets people thinking the animal kinds were created right then and there, after men and before woman, unlike the sequence in chapter 1 where humans were created last. So, were the animals created after Adam? Actually, they weren't. The verse is simply stating the source and the origin of the animal kinds, which were formed out of the dust and spoken into existence by God. Also this is a huge reach on their part. I, I wasn't even planning on covering this. They, they're actually managing to dig their own grave here. I don't have to do any work. I could have sat back and let you guys all just watch this. So notice that God put Adam in charge over all the animals, taking dominion over all of creation. In Hebrew, the precise tense of a verb is determined by the context. Genesis 1 makes it clear that the animals were created before Adam. So Hebrew scholars would have understood the verb formed to mean had formed or having formed, which is how many Bible translations state this passage, including Tyndall's translation, which predates the King James. More so then it does make sense that they're primarily used. So why aren't they using Tyndall's for, for all of them? Uh, Tyndall's, sorry. Tyndall's for all of them. Uh, I don't know about that grammar. Let's check our, our handy dandy Hebrew, confor Hebrew concordance here. Because it will tell us, it will lead the way for us. Hmm. Got dry pasta in my throat. That's what you get for crunching raw pasta. You know? I deserve it. These things, I, the things I do for, for a crunch, you know? In the east of Eden, he put their man whom he had formed, Yasir, or Yasar. Gotta remember that, you guys. And made grow out of the ground, and made, and made grow Yahweh God out of the ground, every tree that is pleasing to the sun. So look at this, now we're making the trees too. Look at this. The trees are just now being made. Genesis Apologetics... I don't know what those guys are on over there, but you need to give me some of that, you know? Okay. Oh my goodness. Oh, we're never going to find this. You guys are spending a very nice portion of your evening watching me scroll through BibleHub.com. And look, and there was gold. And stone. And onyx. And all of these things. When, when is... Ooh, Kush. Nice. 
The name of the river was the Tigris, runs along with the Euphrates, that would make the Fertile Crescent, for those of you who are wondering, the Cradle of Humanity, some say. Um, or, sorry, Cradle of Civilization, Cradle of Humanity would be um, Old of Gorge in Tanzania, where I have been, by the way. Okay, so he's saying you can eat all the good stuff, but don't eat from the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, because the day that you eat it, you're going to die. Of course, that's not what happened. He just couldn't no longer eat from the Tree of Life, which is what ended up killing them. Ah, okay. Mmm. So, you guys know I give credit where credit is due, but had formed is not present here. Um, the, the original Hebrew does not seem to say that. It just says, and formed, or, and Yahweh God, it says, and formed Yahweh God out of the ground, every beast of the field, and every bird of the air. So this is him making everything from the ground. And it makes sense uh, contextually because he also made Adam out of the ground in this case. Whereas in the previous creation story in Genesis 1, everything came out of nothing. So I don't think that that's a fair assessment. Moreover, Hebrew verbs focus on completeness of action, not past, present, future temporality. So they don't have tense like English verbs. Yeah, so that's what you say when you're trying to get it to have a tense, but it doesn't. Instead, the past, present, future of an action verb is determined by context, thus in context with Genesis 1 and Genesis 2.19. So you're making it up. You want it to be two stories, and, and that's why. He's saying he's using Genesis 1 as context to get that had formed. Um, I hope that's clear to everyone, because dishonest. Which uses a verb that denotes completion of actions, can be translated as now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. Given this, the apparent disagreement with Genesis 1 disappears completely. The extra details in the Genesis 2 account demonstrate several things. First, the account affirms Genesis 1 in every way, without contradiction. Second, we find that Genesis 1 and 2 are complementary rather than contradictory. Chapter 1 may be understood as creation from God's perspective. It is the big picture, an overview of the whole and the sequence of God's created works. Light, atmosphere, vegetation, sun and stars, birds and fish, mammals and man. Chapter 2 views the more important aspects from man's per- Does that imply mammals aren't- <laughs> That mammals don't also include humans? It's like, you would think this person had never seen a breast before. Perspective, and expounds upon day six events with details like the names of the first man and woman, their relationship with creation, where they were first placed in the Garden of Eden, naming the animals, and setting the stage for the events that would later occur in the Garden. Looking at it this way, the first two chapters of Genesis provide a cohesive and detailed account of creation. They certainly don't represent two different accounts of creation. They were authorized by Moses, cited by Jesus, and referred to as authoritative by New Testament writers. Looking for answers about what the Bible teaches about creation? The even That's connects Christ's genealogy to Adam and Adam's son who lived after him. How could that be mythical? Without a real Adam, a real garden, a real tree, and a real enemy that led Adam and Eve into sin, the consequences for sin laid out these questions and more. I didn't get time to use my kazoo. I think I'm just going to rewind it and use it anyways. What do you guys think? You got anything better to do? I don't. These questions and more. Good enough. Now, ready for myth four. Let's see what it is. Myth number four is Adam and Eve were not real people, only allegories used to describe the first humans. Many professors... Absolutely yes. This is my wheelhouse. Unfortunately, we're doing it next time, so... But that's okay. We've got that to look forward to. So I want to summarize some things for you here, because I actually had some links that I had pulled up on a separate... A separate dealie. Hold on. Let me let me get them. Let me get them. And I'm going to pull them over to my main window so that you guys can see sort of for yourself. Ooh, excuse me. Um, some kind of thoughts on this. Uh, normally, I'm not really a big fan of like sites like Quora or whatever the deals that seem to just kind of crowdfund, crowdsource the, uh, the answers to questions. But I thought that this was quite poignant um, because it proves my point. Kind of. Um, so this individual asks if the two creation accounts are likely to be from different sources. 
And essentially, they, they mentioned the thing that I'd mentioned earlier, uh, the priestly source versus the Yahwist source. And they also say the almost universal consensus of critical scholars is that the two creation accounts are from two different sources. The accounts, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the same thing. So Leon R. Cass in the beginning of Wisdom, uh, reading Genesis page 54, um, notes that, it, that the second story departs not only in context, but also in tone, mood, and orientation. Um, so, so he says, we're the first story... Uh, that the first story ends with man, where the second begins with him, and the first the animals come first, and man is to be their ruler, but in the second the beasts come after the creation of man as his possible companions. In the first man is to be the master of life on earth, and in the second he is to be the servant of the earth. Finally, in the first story man is directly in the image of God, but in the second he is made of earthly dust and divine breath, and only becomes godlike at the end, and only in transgression. So, you know, I think that this summarizes things quite nicely, and again, while I'm not typically a fan of these kind of answering sites, at least this is something that you can kind of look and, and double check for yourself, um, if you want, by, by just going to, to the actual uh, scripture itself. Bottom line is, there, there's nothing to suggest that these are the same account literally nothing. This isn't like previous events where it's like, well, you know, there's there's evidence for different things and we're, we're just going to go with what the majority thinks um, and sort of the, the literature consensus. This is like there's nothing that supports the notion that, that they are the same account, um, which I'm not surprised. I'm just disappointed. So, but that's showbiz, baby. You know, that's that's what happens when you, when, you know, organizations like these have whatever, 107,000 subscribers and can afford to make, you know, high, high quality videos. They've got to keep pushing them out, um, lest, lest they lose the big bucks. Um, I hate to be cynical, but that's kind of how I feel. Maybe we should watch Noah's Ark and the Flood, Science Confirms the Bible by Answers in Genesis at another juncture. But next time we'll be discussing a little bit of human evolution. I'm very excited for that. Um, in the meantime, do take good care of yourselves. I'm trying to, again, try not to look too much at my zit. Or it's actually kind of a scab now. Don't look too much at it when you're when you're rewatching this, as I know all of you will, because this is this is very um, rewatchable content. <laughs> um, but but take excellent care of yourself. Drink plenty of water. Exercise as much as you can. Stretch. That's a big one. Take your vitamins and medication that's prescribed to you if need be. Um, and and I bid you an excellent rest of your day, evening, or a, a, a lovely slumber. Until next time. Watch.